All right, this is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Nam. And this is Jamal Dajani. Jamal, I am, as you can tell from our pre-show uh, discussion, among the most upset that I've been in a long time with a political development. We're going to be talking about a lot of things today on Arab Talk. I mean, we're going to be covering some of the impeachment stuff, some of the hearings. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with An Yong Su Chi at the United Nations on the uh, case of the uh, decimation and the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya and her defense of her government in their ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya. But as upsetting as that is, the development yesterday with Donald Trump signing an executive order, a Title VI executive order, basically completely obliterating the possibility of genuine free speech toward careful, considered, critical analysis of Israeli apartheid policies, essentially making that illegal by executive order, has made me more upset and is more troubling on in terms of its long-term implications than, than many things that we've talked about. So I think we should spend a fair amount talking about this new executive order done by Donald Trump. It's, a, it's based on the Title VI uh, laws that have been created to protect <clears throat> basically, um, you know, it's a protected class analysis in terms of Title VI protecting certain groups against discrimination. That's right, just and uh, well, uh, this order was signed on Wednesday. Yeah, just yesterday. Right, so, so it's, it's uh, basically uh, very new, and it sets a precedent for a dangerous um, attack on really basic free speech rights. That's, this is, you know, this is like, if you wanted to look at it in any which way, that's it's the most circumventing disturbing. our Constitution, just like, you know, the United States has a history of these so-called executive orders. And most of these executive orders, they came at a time when we look back at it in history, they're kind of, you look at it as a dark time in our history. One of them, for example, is the Executive Order 9066, which is uh, which called for the internment of Japanese Americans during right. World War II. Right. So now, as you know, most political science students and other um, you know uh, fields they study about it. We look, we analyze it, we look at it, and we see that knee-jerk reaction that basically put uh, thousands of Japanese Americans basically in internment camps during the war. They were American citizens. They were stripped out of their uh, basically human rights and all rights uh, offered to them. Another one, you could think about the whole creation of the Patriot Act, which we are still under, Patriot Act 1, Patriot Act 2, right, right after 9-11, another knee-jerk reaction to kind of basically put the Arab Americans and Muslim Americans under a microscope in, in this country and, you know, sp spy on them and do all kinds of things. Right. Can, let me just say one thing really quick. I, I want Our listeners need to know that when, when we're talking about executive orders, Jamal, that means the president, the executive That's branch, right. taking an order to avoid and circumvent the legislative branch. The legi so, so to avoid all the process of legislating, of a law. legislating it, taking through Congress, debating, taking, debating it, bringing expert testimony, uh, uh, constitutional attorneys to weigh in. Exactly. So you bypass all of this. I mean, you know, I mean, it's not even taking it to the Supreme Court, right? So, I mean, in a way, that's the only avenue for you to challenge it. It's through the Supreme Court, I right think, now. or the change or another executive order by another president. Or you could pass a law to kind of circumvent and confront the executive order, but given the political nature of this executive order, it's unlikely that that would happen. But basically, this was a stealth move by the President of the United States to create the conditions such that criticism of the policies of the State of Israel 
could be made illegal. That's right. So, so let's go by, uh, let's go and look at the first initial reports, right? And yeah. actually, the first initial report uh, was uh, on uh, was issued uh, by the New York Times, which basically claimed that the order will effectively interpret Judaism as a race or nationality, not just a religion, to prompt a federal law penalizing colleges and universities deemed to be shirking their responsibility to foster an open climate for minority students. This is how the New York Times interpreted the, the thing, right? This is, you know, so, so basically, it has a subtle language, right? Um, and by the way, I think the order itself, the text uh, has been recently uh, published. Yeah. Uh, so you can look it up. So it also looks at a more subtle, it states discrimination against Jews, which basically may give rise to a violation of U.S. civil rights law. So when the discrimination is based on individual's race, color, or national origin. Understand? Yeah. So it's not the issue is not just about anti-Semitism, which we all condemn it. Yeah, that's not the issue. And that's not the issue. But now it gets closer, right? So the core of the order, and which, by the way, is uh, I don't, I don't want to say copy and paste from what APAC, but it is the Israel lobby uh, and other groups have been calling for basically for many years, which is to criminalize solidarity with Palestinians, especially on U.S. college campuses, campuses. by conflating criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. Exactly. So, so, so by this, the way, it's also to attack front and center, Jamal, we know this, the boycott, divestment, sanction move. That's really the that's really the heart of what they're coming after. They're coming after a nonviolent political movement, the BDS movement, which is not only popular but gaining strength on, on the world stage in confronting these Israeli aggressions uh, globally. And this is really an attack on the BDS movement. Well, yeah, and you're right. This is part of it. I mean, it is because... And we've talked uh, on the show many times that how many how BDS has turned from being just like oh a silly campaign to uh, smear Israel, and I'm just paraphrasing by uh, the words of Benjamin Netanyahu to an existential threat. So now it got elevated to this existential threat, and ever since this has become an existential threat, and we talked about how. Uh, Adelson and Haim Saban uh, raised $100 uh, million dollars to fight it, basically targeting college campuses and then the Israeli government itself creating a whole department right. and allocating a budget, millions of shekels, to basically target BDS. What's been happening recently, Jess, and, and we've talked about the several attempts by different localities from uh, states and localities to kind of, you know, the famous case of uh, in, uh, was it in Texas, putting in fine prints to not give federal aid for those people who, who the victims of the floods. Right. Uh, right. Unless they've... They swear loyalty to the, Israel. They basically check that basically, box that yeah. they will not participate in any BDS thing. Right, right. You know, which is totally unconstitutional. Imagine here you you had your home destroyed and you're applying for federal aid or state aid, and to find out, unless you said that I will not participate in any BDS support, I will not get the federal money that you should be receiving, like everyone else. Also, the other famous case of the school, um, yeah, she's a school teacher. Right, that's right. That uh, the, renew her, the renewal of her contract also was predicated, yeah. predicated with that fine print, you know. So they've lost, by the way. These two cases, they, they lost. lost them. Right. So now they know it's going to be a long battle because they, they try to go through and, you know, they're going state by state, uh, municipality by municipality to try to pass these draconian laws to basically muzzle critics of Israel. 
So what's the fastest way? Because we know any scholar of the Constitution, and you don't have to be a scholar of the Constitution to know what are the limits of your First Amendment. That's right. And so this is an attack. Imagine I can stand in the middle of San Francisco. I can stand in the middle of Union Square and criticize the president of the United States. I can criticize atrocities committed in this country against the indigenous natives of this country, uh, against uh, you know uh, slavery, right? Against those who uh, advocated for slavery. But I cannot criticize apartheid in Israel. I cannot uh, criticize atrocities in Israel. I cannot, uh, uh, you know, we have basically Jim Crow, as we're speaking. That's right. Implemented in Israel. I can look back at it and say once we had it in this country and this was a dark spot and stain on our history. But if I say something like this now on college campuses, if this starts getting implemented, you know what's the threat? The threat is, and they'll we know- They'll take away funding. They'll take away funding. Right. And so we know you have state colleges, you know, there are few probably, you know, private colleges which don't depend as much on state funding, but you know, places like San Francisco State University, UC Berkeley, and then so on going across the board they will lose funding if they don't support this executive order. So that's it's a right. very dangerous precedent, Jess. I think that's right, Jamal. And it's just kind of interesting now to see how this is politically falling out. Because you now have people uh, like Jason Greenblatt and uh, Jared Kushner, who are at the signing ceremony, by the way, uh, with beaming with smiles. And um, some of the representatives there calling Donald Trump uh, the first Jewish president. Remember when they called Bill Clinton the first black president as a way to speak to his uh, commitment to African Americans? Now they're calling Donald Trump the first Jewish president to celebrate this order. Now, on the other side, it's interesting, J Street, which is really no, no great bastion of uh, liberal politics by any, they're kind of a down-the-road political action uh, committee in Washington has even come out and condemned this, Jamal, which is kind of interesting because the people lining up to criticize and condemn this executive order are not just traditional defenders of the Constitution, traditional uh, defenders of free speech, traditional defenders of academic freedom. You now have people who in the political spectrum, like J Street, are now condemning this executive order by Donald Trump. You know, I, I looked at the signing ceremony and I kind of watched it for a while, Jamal. I don't know if you saw the same thing. I couldn't I, stomach it, so I didn't watch it. No, I, I actually believe in my heart of hearts that Donald Trump has no idea what he just did. He doesn't understand the gravity, the depth of the depravity, the depth of the assault on free speech. I am absolutely convinced that it was probably, you know, Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt and some others telling him that he needed to sign something, you know, right away. Maybe it's another distraction against impeachment. Maybe it's another distraction against all the other difficulties he's having. But he has no, no idea about the long-term negative potential consequences of this on the fabric of free speech and academic freedom in the United States. No, and, and neither does he have any familiarity with the Constitution because we know his actions and he constantly violates basically his executive so-called privileges, right? Right. So and we'll get to talk about this when we talk about Yeah, but, every, but this has been roundly criticized. What I'm trying to say, Jamal, is that this has been criticized by Jewish groups, by J Street, and by the broadest spectrum of political and academic leaders throughout the United States. Yeah, and, and just to give it some more, more historical context, just as we know, also this has been on the agenda for decades, you know, as Palestinian activism on campus, campuses grew in the United States, Zionist groups, began filing complaints under Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act with the Department of Education's Office for Civil, Civil Rights, right? So these com complaints, Israel supporters claimed 
that universities, the universities fail to protect Jewish students. We've seen, we've seen these cases on many campuses, including uh, San Francisco State University, uh, and they said, you know, they're not protecting Jewish students by not, by the way, we're not talking about physical protection here, by, but they're, they're kind of tying it this way, but they, they say by not cracking down on Palestinian solidarity activism. Basically, right? basically. So, so this strategy, by the way, the Title VI, you know who, who is its pioneer? It's Kenneth Marcus. Wow. Kenneth Marcus is the one who's behind, basically, and he uh, behind this idea of, okay, it's not working by filing complaints or lawsuits or whatever. Let's go and try the Title VI Avenue. And, uh, and uh, basically, uh, he led it, uh, you know, who, who led the Lewis uh, D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights at the time, before he moved to the Department of Education. Right. You know, which is basically, if you look at the history of the Brandeis Center, what is it? It's an Israel lobby group. It is. Right? You know, it's actually just, I have a secret, little, little known secret. What's that? Which is has nothing to do with Brandeis University. No, it doesn't. It's, it's just unaffiliated. Yeah, it's just, unaffiliated. So people yeah. kind of get confused. They think it's something that's happening at Brandeis University. It doesn't. So he, he you know, this is a confusion. So you have the Lewis D. Brandeis Center unaffiliated with Brandeis University. It's strictly an Israel lobby group. And they started working uh, on charging these college campuses. And guess what? During the... Um, Obama administration, these complaints were thrown out. Always. Yeah, citing basically lack of evidence. That's the number one, not because how they're using them, but actually many of these cases were not true, and they did not, they could not uh, prove them, Prove them, yeah. right? So, so, of course, last year, back to Kenneth Marcus, he announced that the Department of Education, now he's at the Department of Education, will apply standards that conflict criticism, criticism of Israel and Zionism with anti-Jewish bigotry. Wow. So this is the brainchild of Kenneth Marcus. Wow. This is, goes way back. He's been trying it and trying and trying and experimenting. And now, what's his position, right? Well... This is the this is the easiest way to do it, Jamal. Because if you can't get a legislative solution, if you can't get a legal so solution, the easiest way to create uh, the conditions to get this somewhat sanctioned is through an executive order. It doesn't have the backing of the legislature. It doesn't have the backing of the judicial branch. It doesn't have the backing of any kind of weight of law. It's, as we've been saying, is, is an executive order. Now, the status of executive orders has been challenged across the board. And we know this because Donald Trump is fond of saying that he signed more executive orders than, you know, than, than Barack Obama and George Bush probably combined. I mean, he signs executive orders like they're going out of style. But what is not clear, Jamal, is the legal foundation for the legitimacy. Well, of, there is no legal foundation. That's my point. So this is where we get to the good news, Jamal. Okay. The good news is, as usual, pro-Israel, pro-Zionist supporters have overplayed their hand yet again. Because what this has done, this outrageous executive order has done, has mobilized a broad spectrum of academic freedom uh, proponents of legal scholars, a broad spectrum of uh, a, a coalition, including a number of Jewish groups, you know, um, academic groups across the United States who are going to confront this. And they're going to confront it legally, politically, as well as legislatively. And it will go down in a ball of flames eventually. But the chaos that it will create it's going to create mass solidarity, but it's going to create a lot of chaos on the way to getting there. I'm not as optimistic as you are. <coughs> in, I, I know eventually, just like, but the, that eventually this will be overturned. 
But the damage, just like Executive Order 9066, which right. called for the internment of Japanese Americans. Did a lot of damage. It did a lot of damage. And the, uh, this, this, this thing has been in planning for many years. And it didn't happen in a vacuum, Jess. Uh, Kenneth Marcus and, and his allies have been working on this for many years, and they have been taking maybe small steps, putting the foundation for this, right? And each time they were able to achieve something to kind of create this whole pyramid that's going to be now harder to overturn. But it's a pyramid scheme, Jamal. Okay, uh, I, I'm with you on this. But uh, think about it this way. Because people also did not challenge, for example, the State Department's its own definition. Remember, we talked about this. This was like a few years ago. I don't right. know, two, three years ago, when the State Department, which uh, changed its definition of anti-Semitism, and there was no debate, and there were no legal scholars brought in. It was actually pretty much dependent on what APAC gave it and other, and I'll tell you exactly where they got their definition. So, uh, so when they, they did that, basically, when the State Department changed their definition of anti-Semitism to include criticism of Israel by suggesting the use of the International Holocaust Remembers, uh, Remembrance Alliance That's right. definition. So they, they, they did not hire experts. They did not get legal support. They didn't actually bring different segments of the Jewish population in this country, you know, because we have, you know, just we don't only have uh, APAC supporters. We have Jewish Voice for Peace. We have other communities. There are there are Jews who don't believe in Zionism. And we so have forth. secular Jews. Anti, anti, you know, they basically went to one organization, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And they said, what's your definition of anti-Semitism? And basically their definition of anti-Semitism uh, and that antifa, anti identifies anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. That's the one basically piece of paper they had. Unbelievable. And so basically uh, the... Uh, Holocaust Remembers Alliance definition effectively characterizes all Palestinian resistance, much of which view Zionism as racist and as anti-Semitic. So this was already, I think it was actually already in the books during the Obama administration. This is not, this is, by the way, did not happen during the Trump administration uh, when the State Department. I think it did happen with the Trump administration. Well, at least I remember Pompeo doing something with this. Maybe, but I know, but actually I remember this was maybe a refer to when you went to the State Department site, you clicked on a link and it took you to this definition and yeah. people actually complained and moaned and groaned, but nothing has changed. Nobody changes. So they armed with this, they have this, right? So they have this. Then they tried the route of going through the different, uh, like I said, different states and, and trying to pass different uh, well, that's where laws they, that's and so where they Well, that's where they failed. That's exactly where they failed. And, and because they failed, the shortest cut, and who, who else do you have? I mean, this is kind of like uh, their dream come true. Donald Trump in, in office. And I'm, I'm actually also thinking about Donald Trump is really attacking Palestinians' rights, both in the United States and, uh, and, and abroad, and in, in particularly in Palestine, with a vengeance. Yes, no other I mean, with a vengeance. I mean, I mean, the day one he 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 take you know he goes into office and he says, "Oh, I'm going to come," you know, th throws the school aid uh, term and say. Deal of the century, and everybody drinks that Kool-Aid. Deal of the century, and now we see what's in that deal, in that concoction of the deal of the century. So he goes to the deal of the century, moves the uh, American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and says that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, Annex, approves the annexation of the Syrian Golan Heights to Israel, says that settlements are not illegal. Imagine. This is something, a definition that has, has been 
in the box under international law that applies everywhere, not just the, to yeah. the, the West Bank. Settlements, are, you know, this is a violation of, if people don't know about settlements, it's a violation of the Gene Fourth Geneva Convention, mm -hmm. not only the creation of settlements, but the transfer of population, victors or those who got defeated. In other words, you can't move, transfer right. the victorious population into territories you occupied during a conflict. That's so right. he's saying settlements, yeah, you know, that's, that, that's not, uh, they're, they're not illegal. And now he's signing an executive order. All within, all within three years. Right. You know, most of it happened basically in the past two years. So the question is, with everything that we have that's going on, impeachment that he's facing, uh, trade wars, whatever, with China, uh, all the conflicts around the world, environment, etc., Donald Trump puts more time and energy in attacking Palestinian rights. So is this something that he just kind of like, you know, staken on as a crusade, his own personal See, crusade? I, I don't think so. Is someone Not pushing that, him to do this? Yeah. And, and, that, and the other thing is, why is he doing it in a hurry? Like, it gives me an impression maybe... You know, he thinks that he's going to be a one-termer. Or those people who are behind him think that he is going to be a one-termer, well, that let's hurry up and pass all these crazy ideas and, and basically, you know, see, uh, create facts on the ground. And this is what Israel has been doing to Palestinians for the past 70 years. See, Jamal, I think that the last option you gave is the most reasonable the reason they're trying to do this so quickly, and let's not forget, uh, uh, if you look at the Israeli side for a minute, let's not forget that the Israelis are going for a third uh, election now because they failed to form a government. So the Israeli political establishment and Benjamin Netanyahu, who has been indicted, is in complete chaos. That's number one. Number two, the anxiety about Donald Trump being a one-term president has been ratcheted up in this last month because of the impeachment uh, hearings and everything that's going on with the impeachment in Ukraine and, and things like that. So I don't think that this is coming out of a deep, you know, personal belief on Donald Trump's part, but a mass anxiety on Jason Greenblatt, AIPAC, Jared Kushner, they're freaking out that they may only have one term with Donald Trump and that they better get all of these racist, anti-Palestinian uh, causes done by executive order before it's too late. Let's remind our listeners, Jamal, that an executive order is not law. Well, it is a law. No, it's not. It's an order. It's an order, but it's, it's, it's not enforceable. But it's enforceable. It is not technically enforceable. It is easy to unenforce. It's not enforceable legally at the same level as a law. It's actually a really interesting analysis about what an executive order is and what it isn't and its legal limitations. So it can be challenged. Whether or not the Congress will challenge it is another story. Whether or not and I do think this is what happened. It will go to the Supreme Court. Of course it will. It will be challenged at many different levels. But the amount of time that will take, Jamal, as you said, the damage will be done. I think we're both on the same page, that this is incredibly damaging. This is incredibly um, devastating to anybody who believes in, in freedom, in self-determination, in free speech, in the rule of law. This is a complete abomination to those things. The only place where you and I may disagree is on timing, mm -hmm. because um, what I hear on the other side is that there is a mass mobilization against this executive order. Completely. You're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Uh, we also welcome uh, your comments on Facebook Live. We have actually a comment on Facebook Live. Yeah, yes. we do. What's the comment? It says, uh, uh, Jared Kushner wrote a piece in the New York Times about how this will protect Jewish students, but the New York Times editorial board did not support it. Well, of, well, of course they didn't support <laughs> Well, of course they didn't support it, Jamal. Why would they support it? I mean, the New York Times, despite its 
abject uh, record on the question of Palestine couldn't even bring itself to get behind this outrageous thing that Jared Kushner. And it, let's let's be clear, this is something that Jared Kushner has been spearheading. It's been something that has been part of his portfolio. And as we said before, the the deal of the century peace plan with Palestine has been a complete disaster. So of course he's going to go for something like this, right? And of course the New York Times is going to support something like this. Well, here is the thing, and, and this is what I'd like to hear from <clears throat> our viewers on Facebook Live and, and others. What do they think about this law, and especially our uh, uh, Jewish viewers? Does this law protect Jewish students on college campuses? And is there an issue, or does it basically really cover, is, is a cover-up for the rise of white supremacy and the real anti-Semitism that we've been seeing right. on the rise, the real Islamophobia that we've been say, uh, seeing on the rise, the real rise in the amounts of hate and racist attacks that we're seeing. So, so when you come up and you just like focus this, because basically what you're saying is all these anti-Semites, all these white supremacists, we don't have, I mean, that, that, you know, that's, we, I don't see these criticisms going after them or these specific laws targeting them and saying, well, the real issue that we have on college ca uh, campuses, that the safety and the well-being of Jewish students on college campuses is Palestinian activism and not white, white supremacy. supremacy. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, this is what it is. What's what Trump is saying? So, talking about how he's going to be enforcing it, okay, in a way. So basically, you know, as you know, Trump is is, is threatening to take away funding from schools who for allowing public criticism of Israel. These are his words. This is our message to universities. This is Donald Trump. If you want to accept tremendous amounts of federal dollars that you get every year then you must reject anti-Semitism. So know, he, has, he's choose, he chose to in, basically to interpret what's anti-Semitism, right. which is the conflation of the criticism of Israel. Exactly, Jamal. And, and of course he doesn't understand this. And of course he's just a puppet, really, for this larger political scheme put together by Marcus uh, Kushner, Greenblatt, APAC and the rest of the crew, but I, I think you're getting to something that is really important. It's going to backfire, but it's going to backfire, which in a way that I really worry about, because it's really going to give license to the hateful white supremacists now. They're, they're going to use this, Jamal. And How so? I, I think this just gives them more ammunition to get inflamed with their they're truly anti, because they are truly anti-Semitic. The, the white nationalists, the white supremacists uh, that everybody believes, you know, has been emboldened by Donald Trump, this will give them, this will give their movement even more energy. And I really do worry because of the legitimate anti-Semitic activities that are going on that are, have nothing to do with this uh, executive order that Donald Trump has signed. This executive order has everything to do with criminalizing free speech and criminalizing Palestinian uh, 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 activism. That's really what it is. What they're missing, Jamal, is the real anti-Semitism that is out there that is hurtful, violent, and, you know, gaining force. And it doesn't do anything to kind of confront that in this country right now. Well, I mean, also, uh, we should also mention that uh, now uh, we're... <clears throat> Seeing a lot of criticism from Jewish groups of this and, of this executive of this, order, and, and some yeah. some groups are saying that actually Donald Trump is the worst president for Jews in this country. Absolutely, you know because of what he's doing. And Jamal, even J Street condemned this. J Street is no liberal <laughs> Jewish organization. They're a, they're a very moderate, you know, political action committee that supports the two-state solution and a lot of really, you know, basically problematic political agendas. 
And if J Street is critical of this, we can only begin to imagine the range of Jewish voices that are critical of this executive order. I, I, I could tell you on the academic side, which is w where I've been reading and, and kind of paying attention to the response, within one week, Jamal, and before the end of the year, you're going to see a mass campaign in the academic community confronting, condemning, and taking issue with this executive order. Well, this is, here is another question that we have, uh, basically saying, what nationality are Buddhists? What nationality are Muslims? What nationality are Catholics? Uh, it's a great question. They're not nationalities. That's the point. Well, I mean, this is the whole idea behind this concept is now uh, basically uh, Donald Trump is conflating, it, yeah. again, Judaism with a nationality. It's simply not. And this is what many members of the Jewish community are saying, well, you know, I'm a Jew from uh, England, I'm from Poland, I'm from this, I'm from that, just like any other religion. So, so how is that flying this fast in, in this definition? Well, that's exactly right. That's the thing that's going to be confronted, Jamal, and I think the the person who's been, uh, who put that question out is absolutely right. This is the conflation. This is the confusion. This is the hand waving to, to, to do all this. And um, this is one of the times where I hope I'm right again over you. I, I really do hope that this is going to be confronted head on. The, the problem, Jamal, this may be our segue, is because... The Trump administration right now is flailing so much. They're failing and flailing. They're failing on international matters. They're failing on trade matters. They're failing on domestic issues. Were it not for what they claim is a good stock market, which is not equated with a good economy, were it not for people's, you know, looking at their 401ks, you could even arguably say that we're in among the worst periods politically uh, in, you know, in the United States in many, many, many decades. Were it not for those things, Jamal, how would Donald Trump get away with all of these outrageous executive orders? I mean, let's not forget that within a week, there is going to be uh, a vote taken in the Congress to impeach Donald Trump, and he will only be the third president in the history of the republic, in the history of the United States, to be impeached. Uh, you know, Andrew Johnson, uh, Bill Clinton, and it'll be Donald Trump. He'll be one of three people in the history of the United States that will go down historically as being an impeached president. So, you know, things are looking bad uh, for Mr. Trump right now. And he can sign these executive orders and he can do all these things that uh, will uh, support the state of Israel and be anti-Palestinian, anti-free speech. But I think he's even headed for bigger, bigger trouble than, than this uh, executive order. Except that he's not, I mean, you know, yes, we know uh, where we're heading with these impeachment hearings. I'm, I've been getting a headache just watching and then trying to keep track about who said what and who testified and who didn't testify. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, the House will impeach Donald Trump. Uh, uh, maybe very few defectors, maybe one or two. Uh, there might be one or two Republican defectors. You know, but when it hits the Senate, the Senate is not going to basically remove him. Remove him. No, they won't. And they've already made, you know, you have 53 Republican senators, and they've already made it clear in the way, and this is the something that when you watch this debate, we are a split nation, Jess. Two different words. I hear the Republicans say something kind of like, that's totally irrelevant, the way they defend which I haven't been, I haven't heard that even, you know, like during the, you know, there was some consensus during the Bill Clinton, even though it was kind of same thing, the GOP against the Democrats, but 
There is a mild consensus. Was well, a mild consensus here is there's no way on earth like you're gonna you know turn others you know like the Republicans are going to take any kind of action. They are uh, crying basically. This is a conspiracy theory. This is a conspiracy from day one to remove a president who got uh, democratically elected, got more than 60 million votes, and the Democrats want to change history because they're sore losers. Yeah, that's basically their that's basically their their um, argument. Well, e even though that this is a, a divide a divided country, Jamal, it's not as divided as we think because, as it turns out, just based on pure polling, there still is a plurality of, of Americans who believe that what Donald Trump did was in fact illegal, was in fact not appropriate for a president, was not appropriate for a president to uh, basically shake down the foreign, a foreign government, a foreign leader of another government, to try to get him to act on behalf of the personal interests of Donald Trump and not in the national interests of the United States. The majority of Americans still believe that's wrong. So it's not exactly divided, but w what we know politically, it is more divided than it is re really among the larger population of people in the United States. In the Senate and in the House, yes, it seems like there's a relatively, you know, what you could call relatively even division. Uh, it's very split. It's very clean. But I'll tell you, Jamal, the rest of the country really is sick and tired of this. The majority of people, really his support is about 37 to 43 percent. The majority of Americans are tired of him. They don't trust him. They think he's done bad things. How that's going to translate in an election, we have no idea. No, well, this is the question, because the question is if his core group, his base, Donald Trump's base, supports him, no matter what, then the impeachment hearings could backfire, in a way, yeah. on the Democrats. Yeah. And maybe this is why he's doing these extra things to like, oh, I want the Jewish vote. I want uh, the, uh, um, you know, the Christian Zionists uh, vote in this country because the more that I do to appease APAC, it's just going to have, it's going to resonate, you know, nicely with these, uh, with these groups. Yeah. You know, so, so can these two things be connected? Because you see, like Donald Trump, he's been attacked on all these fronts. He doesn't care. Kind he of doesn't. Like, and then he does these extra things to kind of like, even including like playing with the economy through his uh, different tweets and statements about China. Stock market goes up. He tweets another one. Stock market yeah. goes down. Something about China. So it's playing games, and this is another distraction. You know, even though it's going to do a lot of hurt, you know, to our civil rights. Basically, most of, I think that's the most important thing, which is the First Amendment on in the United States and on college campuses. And then there is the damage that has been done. You know, I don't want to even call it in any kind of future peace agreements between Palestine and Israel. No, it's that's, done. That's, he doesn't care about this. It's all a charade, you know, this whole thing about the uh, deal of the century because he's taking unilateral actions right. to, to basically appease one particular group and alienate everyone else. He doesn't care. I'm sorry to say this again, Jamal, but I may be right. He may get reelected. Well, you've been saying this, which is a very sad statement. It is. Nevertheless, oh, but, and by the way, one more thing I wanted to say about this executive order. I haven't heard a single statement from any of the Democratic candidates. They won't about say it. anything. It's anything to say this is unconstitutional, what's the timing of this, nothing. So it's kind of like it's non-existent as far as their campaign. And then back, you know, to your statement... I'm really worried, and I think millions of Americans and Democrats should be really worried, that they're not showing you anything as far as having some momentum. They don't. They're putting all their eggs uh, in this basket of impeachment, which is really dangerous. They're putting like, maybe, you know, this is what's going to bring, uh, this is going to be the demise of Donald Trump, but it's not. So what have they been doing? 
Nothing. Nothing. Do you think like Biden will defeat Donald Trump, for example? Do you, do you want an honest answer? I don't think he can beat him. So, so, so here we go. I mean, then you look at all of this. The impeachment is just another, is, is a distraction. It is. Instead of focusing on the real issues, like what's wrong in this country, just to focus on attacking him personally, which means he's going to just circle the wagons, which is they've been doing this. The GOP, by the way, I wish I can, if we were on TV, just rewind that tape to take you to all the statements they used to say against Donald Trump when he was a candidate. All, you know, remember, they will. Oh, they he's will. a joke, he, he'll never win, you know, he's a crook, he filed for bankruptcy. All these people who were against him, they are all lining up behind him. 100%. But the Democrats are divided. And they are throwing Bernie Sanders, Again, Un under the bus, under the bus and leaving you with basically Hillary Clinton uh, to 2.0, 2.0, which yeah. is Biden. Yeah, but even Hillary Clinton has not ruled out. I know you read this. Uh, I don't think has not did. ruled out a run on 2020. Every single Democrat, Jamal, has played into the hands of Donald Trump's crazy ideas, they are paving the way for his reelection. I'm sorry to say that. I don't believe that Joe Biden can beat Donald Trump. And then when you look at how many people of color have dropped out of the race, what we're left with is a very homogenous uh, kind of, you know, four or five people who are running. And then you have Mayor Bloomberg throwing his hat into the ring. The, mili Red, the billionaires. The billionaire. billionaires club. They can. Tom Steyer, the billionaire, throwing mm. his hat into the ring. So you are going to alienate a lot of Democratic voters. You're going to alienate progressive voters. You're going to split the Democratic vote. And we're going to have, I'm sorry to say this, the chances of another re-election of Donald Trump do not look that Bad. Very sad, very sad statement and assessment from you. But anyway, I accept it. I think it's very possible. Let's put it this way. I want to go back to something that you said earlier. Uh, we have a few minutes left. And you said something like, okay, well, yeah, this is the executive order. The executive order is not a law. And then watch, let's watch and see what uh, academia you've been uh, following yeah. this that they're going to be united and working a front to kind of combat this executive order. Tell me more about this. I don't see anything. I mean, I see, I see lip service, but uh, will this really happen? Like, you know, yeah, having think... major administrations on college campuses pushing back when uh, this com well, came into effect as of yesterday? Yeah, that's a very good question, Jamal. So here's the problem. Academics, faculty, teachers, uh, students are, are absolutely united across this country against this executive order. Where it gets complicated is that the administrators and presidents of universities and boards of directors of universities who are the money people at the level of academy, academics and uh, the academy are not going to be the ones that are going to come out critical of this. So you're going to sit, see a split in the academy. Of course, everybody, the majority of academics, faculty, teachers, students, are going to be united against this executive order. But you're not going to see the same unanimity and support among presidents of universities, who will, who will largely, I think, Jamal, remain silent, and boards of directors, and uh, people who are responsible for the finances of universities, unfortunately, I believe, will remain silent on this. In order for this to be confronted and defeated, it's going to have to be a grassroots effort at the level of faculty, academics, teachers, and students. Well, where does this leave us, especially if, as you said, uh, the upper echelon of the academia, I mean, in, in a way, you know, 
presidents and provosts and whatever, they get a letter in the mail and said, there was a complaint about this campus that you're allowing Palestinian activism on campus. And by the way, we were going to transfer the $20 million. And we're holding it up. We're holding it up. So I think that's exactly where we're headed. And then when that happens, unfortunately, we're going to have to go to the level of, uh, of a judicial solution. It's going to have to be the courts that are going to decide. So, so you're talking about really you need to have a basically mobilize the civil rights community. That's what I think. And organizations and take it to court, like in a, basically the legal arm, basically right. fighting it in court. Which is where we've won. We, in, in terms of the issue of Palestine legally, Jamal, in these academic settings, we've won all the big cases. Except I was trying, I spent some time, and I don't think I've um, received all the answers that I wanted about the uh, limitation uh, of executive powers. So because this is not a law, just like executive privilege, I did not see any kind of precedent before, like whether through, you know, like I cite Executive Order 9066, Japanese internment. Uh, all these challenges, none of them succeeded. It was always reversed through another executive order right. by another president. So if Donald Trump, let's say, loses in 2020, and then, you know, a new president <coughs> comes into power and says, this is nonsense, we're not going to enforce this. So I haven't seen, so that's, that's my fear. It's like, okay, you could mount this campaign, but it's really a PR campaign that's trying right. to force him to change his mind. Well, on that bombshell, we've come to another end of uh, Arab Talk here on KPOO, 89.5 FM here in San Francisco. We've been broadcasting live from San Francisco. We've been broadcasting live on Facebook Live, Jamal, on Jamal Dajani 2. You can go to our website, ArabTalkRadio.com, and get all of these shows, all of these podcasts for your listening. So uh, thanks again for listening today. We'll see you next week. See you next week.